and get even better. Because right now, we have someone coming to speak to us who really, I would say, embodies what Freedom Fest and Freedom Rising is all about. That's our theme this year, Freedom Rising. The idea that you get knocked down, you still come back, and you make it. When everybody goes, you're done, you're not going to make it, you can come back. Freedom Rising. Our next speaker embodies that. He waved the American flag, and many did not, in the 1968 Olympics. He took a stand. He also is the oldest heavyweight champion that ever lived. He is a person that has done so much. As a matter of fact, you as the audience will get a chance to grill him. <laughs> I know, I know. I had to throw that in there. He became the champion at age 46, beating a man who was 20 years younger than him. As a matter of fact, he did it at the MGM Grand right next door. This is a man who embodies what being an entrepreneur is all about. He's a man, yes, who was very successful in his profession. He trained. He became good. He became the best. He became the champ. Now, he's here to show us lessons that we can learn and use in our own life. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a distinct honor for me to welcome the champ, George Foreman. <laughs> Thank you, I'm happy to be with you. Uh, I don't know how you got Don King off the stage. <laughs> you gotta make promises to him. He, I don't know if he told you, I was the heavyweight champion of the world. And uh, way back, back in the day, and uh, for the first time, and I was knocking people out one by one, you line them up, I knocked them down. And so, Don King came to me in Livermore, California. He said, George, <clears throat> that's why you gotta have something going on if you're gonna go in business. You better learn how to cry. You gotta learn how to dance. You gotta learn how to do something other than what you do. You gotta add something to it. So Don King came up, he said, George, I got this fight with Muhammad Ali, and this was just as I'm getting ready to fight Ken Norton. I said, does he understand that I'm probably going to get beat by Ken Norton? He said, well, listen, George, no one gives me an opportunity. He said, they stop me because of the color of my skin. They stop me because they think I'm a gangster. They stop me, and George, and tears started rolling, rolling out of his eyes. I said, really, they stop you for all those reasons? He said, yeah, George, please give me a chance, please. I said, uh, I said, what are you going to give me? He said, five million dollars. And at that time, no one had ever earned that kind of money. He said, but I got to give Ali five million too. I said, I don't care. I'd give him five myself. <laughs> Just to get a hold to him. So I signed a blank sheet of, paper, sheet of paper because I thought he couldn't do it anyway. But the idea of helping someone who just didn't believe someone would give him an opportunity. I said, I'm going to sign right on this paper and you build a contract around it. Put the money in a letter of credit and you got to fight. Really, George? Never seen a guy stop crying so quick. <laughs> and he made the George Foreman or Muhammad Ali, they call it the rumble in the jungle. I call it the mugging in the jungle. Because <laughs> I went there with a championship belt, two belts, and left with none. I was mugged. And even now, people say, well, George, they said you lost the fight to Muhammad Ali because he psyched you out, and uh, you were mad at him, and you were just angry because of the things he was saying. And a friend of mine just reminded me, if you look around on the internet anywhere, you will not see a photograph of Don King, George Foreman, and Muhammad Ali, because we were never together. We signed the contract, I spoke to him on the telephone, 
I said, you sure you want this fight with me? I told Ali, he said, yeah, yeah, I'll promote it. I said, really? As soon as they announced the fight, the next day I heard him in a press conference saying, George is a Frankenstein monster. I said, that ain't promoting it. But then I said, he's only calling me the Frankenstein monster because that's who I am. But we were never together in a press conference. We never did a press conference together at all. That fight was that big, it didn't even need it. And uh, so, doing Don King a favor, poor guy. <laughs> and doing Muhammad Ali a favor, poor old guy. I get in the ring with Muhammad Ali and I beat him up the first round. He hit me, of course. And I beat him up the second round. He hit me again, of course. But it wasn't getting in the world. I just kept beating this guy. Finally, about the seventh round, I hit him hard and he fell on me. And I thought, now I got him. When he fell on me, he says, that all you got, George? <laughs> all I was thinking, you doing Don King a favor here? That was all I had. <laughs> the eighth round there, I'm on the campus. He hit me with the fast, most fast right hand I've ever been hit before. I'm laying on the campus here. One, two. I'm thinking, man. When I jumped up, I was no longer heavyweight champ of the world. I thought I had lost the dearest thing in my life, the heavyweight championship of the world. And to the worst guy in the world, he's over there screaming, did I tell you? <laughs> Doing Dunn King a favor. <laughs> All because Dunn King was crying. I ended his tears and started my own tears. <laughs> and it would take 20 years to get my world championship back. But I was willing to work. <laughs> I just said that because when I saw Don King there, this man was most powerful with such history to make those boxing matches, big boxing matches, and he did it with his tears. But I did mine. I had my love affair, and that's what I'll talk about briefly about my first love affair. No one ever forgets their first love affair. I think when you're about 14, or 13, 14, and 15, you fall so deeply in love, it's never like that ever again. That first love affair, I never forgot it. My first love affair was sleep. <laughs> Oh, I love sleep. <laughs> I'd get up in the morning, and uh, it's time to go to school, put on a show for my folks, walk out like a nice boy going to school, get close to the school and make my rounds back through the woods, come back to my home, climb through the window, and get back in the bed. And <sighs> <laughs> then I had a timer, because I'd get up about 2.30, jump up, go same march around, and leave the school like a good boy, everybody thought I was going to school. And I loved it. But because that was my love affair, I'd sleep, I could stand up and sleep. <laughs> when I did make it to school, the teacher, I'd wake up, look like I knew they were watching me. And when they weren't watching, I'd go back to sleep. I slept all through school. But that love affair had to end. It had to end. Once, a cousin of mine who stayed home, I thought she had gone to work. She'd come to Houston to get a job. She said she was leaving, so when I crawled back in the window, she saw me crawling through the window. She said, hey, vest. She called me vest, because I slept in a vest. She said, what you doing? I said, oh, I forgot something. She said, oh, George, you didn't forget anything. Oh, see, I, see, I forgot something. I'm going to school. She said, you didn't forget anything. I said, I'm going to school. She said, no one in this family ever goes to school. I said, yeah, but I'm going to be something. She said, go to sleep. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell no one in this family ever becomes anything. I said, that's a lie. Then she started naming one member. Said, yeah, you're right about that, but I'm going to be something. She said, I'm not going to tell that. Go back to sleep. You're not going to be anything. I got so angry with my cousin, I jumped up, went to the door, slammed the door, and I almost went to school. 
But the idea that someone can just write you off so quickly, I wouldn't sit in the woods thinking, hmm, this I am. Gonna be something I don't know in these woods. But that was the end of my love affair with sleep. So one day in my ambition, I went out to decide, since <laughs> I gotta do something, my friends and I started mugging people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as I was out one night, wasn't even doing much, the police saw me and my friends. And they chased behind me, and I was the bigger of the one, because I was strong on the guys, and the smaller guys would get their wallet. But the police ganged on me. I said, what am I gonna do? And I saw a house, because I heard the police coming climbed and crawled underneath the house to hide from the police. And I got into the house and I got scared. My mom used to always give these lectures when my sisters were sitting around and they boasted. Papa never had any thieves in his, in his family. No one in Papa's family ever went to jail. All of his children, no one were criminals. And I was like, why do they keep saying that over with me? And I'd sit there and smile, but I was the criminal. But under that house, I heard my mother's voice saying, Papa never had any thieves. Then I had to go call back on my education because the police were getting close. I'd seen the movie, the FBI, and whenever the criminals were being pursued and they couldn't catch them, they'd go out and get their dogs. And in my neighborhood, you see those police with the dogs. And when the dogs would get close to them, the criminals would crawl into the water and go off on them get out on the other side and the dogs couldn't smell through the water and they would be free and I thought, wow. And I remember looking under that house, I guess it was a busted sewage pipe. <laughs> or a slop under there, I said. I covered myself, I said, what's part mud? From head to toe so the dogs wouldn't smell from me. I mean, wouldn't sniff me out. And I laid there thinking, if I ever get from under this house, I'll never steal anything from anyone, ever. I'm gonna do something with my life. And I heard my cousin saying, nobody in this family ever becomes anything. Anyway, I crawled from under the house, and two kids were walking by, I said, see the police? They said, no. <laughs> and I started walking. My sisters asked me when I got home, where have you been? I said, nowhere. But I had been on a journey of my life. I heard a commercial. Jim Brown, the football player, and Johnny Unitas, the great quarterback from Baltimore Colts in those days, said, if you're looking for another chance, join the Job Corps. And I joined the Job Corps. I joined. And I went into the Job Corps. Grass Pass, Oregon is where I landed. Out in the woods. I was so homesick. I miss my mother so much. Kept getting into trouble, though. Then I got another love affair. Let me tell you about this new love affair. I still have it too. One time, the center director caught me in so many fights. He said, we're gonna kick you out, George. I said, what? I've never had three meals in my life. They give you breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I said, don't kick me out of here. He said, but you keep getting into trouble. I said, but don't, don't kick me out. So he gave me a duty to dig a hole five feet deep. I'm sorry, four feet deep, four feet wide. He said, it lives in granite, Grants Pass, Oregon. There's a lot of granite up there, so I had a power drive. Finally, and I scooped it out. It took me days. He said, you'll be the only one to work on it. I got it dug. And at the end of the day, he said, George, since you dug the hole, you can have the honor. This is going to be for the sinner's flagpole. Flag, pole, hole. I just wanted to stay in the program. He said, so because of that, you'll be honored to raise the flag, the American flag, the first day on our grand opening here. I said, great. Went back to my dormitory and I told all of the guys, the little counselor was there. He said, well, George, be careful out there raising the flag. I said, why? He said, because if it hits the ground, it's dead. What? He said, you be careful. And everybody looked at me, I said, you gonna raise it. Kids laughed, I said, God, that's what got me in trouble, beating people up. I had to raise that flag 
I said, suppose it falls out of my hand and dies in front of all those people. So I finally got it up, the wind hit it. That was my love affair with, with the American flag. I heard a guy speak, call him. Uh, he was talking, giving a demonstration with the strongest, he was the strongest man I've ever seen. He did a push-up with the heaviest kid in the job course center. He looked at me as if to say, some of you are getting into fights all the time because of names. Folks are calling you. People calling your names. Just don't worry about what people call you. Don't worry about names people call you. You're an American. That's your name. And no one can take that away from you. Hmm. I like that. One night, in the day room in the job course, said, um, there was a boxing match on. It was Cassius Clay fighting Floyd Patterson in those days. And after the fight was over, all the kids looked at me and said, George, you're such a big bully. You think you're so tough. Why don't you become a boxer? It's okay, I'll show you. I'm going to be a boxer. So that made me travel to Pleasanton, California, where I, they had another job course center where I take up boxing. I met the boxing coach, Doc Brothers, walked up to him. I said, hey, I want to be a boxer. He said, you're big enough and you're ugly enough. Come on down to the gym. <laughs> and I, it wasn't even two weeks I was in the gym. He had a fight for me. I said, okay. Boxing match. All the kids would come to the gym, and I, when I saw the guy that I was in the box, he was so skinny, you could see his ribs. So I went and told all my friends, please come see me fight. I got one big rib here, I don't want to be him. So I got into the ring that night, and he hit me with something called a jab. Boom. I said, you better not do that again. But, uh, boom, he did it again, so I tried to pick him up. They said, no, put him down, you can't do that. <laughs> They laughed me out of the gym. I said, I'll never get back into boxing again. I'm done with that sport. All oh, those people laughed.